Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for coming out on what's really a gorgeous day, where I'm sure there are many other things that you could be doing. Today is really designed to give you additional information about the concept of Medicare for All. This, is a, this obviously has picked up a lot of steam over the last couple of years, and I would argue that it sort of began with Bernie Sanders kind of introducing the concept nationally. And one of my concerns is that most people don't understand what we're talking about. Obviously, this is a kind of moral issue, as, as uh, Bud would say, and I totally agree, and that health care really should be a right. <coughs> Something Excuse that me, could you, could you speak up? I don't know if I can, but I'll try. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Health care really should be a right. And I suspect that most of you here agree with that concept. The question becomes how you structure and implement a plan that's going to be across the board and cover all individuals. So today we're trying to get a little bit beyond the kind of sound bites that most of you have heard and to get a better understanding of what this concept of Medicare for All is all about. I use the term concept of Medicare for All because I look at that as an umbrella. There are obviously a lot of things that have been bantered around and it becomes somewhat confusing. Personally, I prefer the term universal health care because I think that really gets at the heart of it. When you start sort of partitioning yourself off of these different titles, who the heck knows what we're talking about? So from my perspective, we're talking about universal health care. And I think both of the presenters are in agreement. You'll hear a bit of a history about how we've gotten to this point and some perspectives on proposals that are being considered. After that time, we'll open the floor up to conversation. I have a couple of questions myself, and we'll probably kick those off. But we really want this to end up being a discussion so that you can walk away from this with more clarity about the direction that's being taken, as well as the role that you can play in getting this all done. So we're first going to have Lloyd Alterman, who is a physician. He practiced nephrology and internal medicine in Essex and Union, Union County for over 33 years. He's become an advocate for Medicare for All, believing that providing needed health care to all citizens is the morally right thing to do and that Medicare for All is an economically viable solution to providing all Americans with necessary health care. We're then going to hear from Bennett Zorowski. Sometimes I massacre his name, I apologize. Okay, He's a general counsel to the New Jersey Universal Health Care Coalition. His Newark law practice is devoted to the representation of unions, employees, and it includes extensive pro bono representation for progressive organizations and demonstrators alike. A strong advocate for people rather than profit centered health care. He has represented individuals and community groups in many battles, including the unfortunately, I don't know why you added this, unfortunately unsuccessful campaign to prevent Plainfield Muhlenberg Hospital from closing. Again, as Irene mentioned, my name is Edgar Brisbane. I will work as the moderator. I'm about a 22 year resident of Maplewood, and I operate a business called Silver Lining Advantage, which focuses on giving navigational support to seniors who are facing issues of long-term care. So that's who I am. Thank you for coming. Lloyd, you have the floor. Thank you. And thank you all for coming on this beautiful early spring day. Um, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about the history of the healthcare system and introducing the concept of Medicare for All and explaining to you why I believe it's the right thing to do and this is the right time to do it. Um, before I do that, though, I, I just want to tell you a story. Um, I think we, we have a problem in this country not only with health care for us humans, but even for our pets, our animals. Um, I had an experience this week which I, I couldn't believe, so I thought I'd share it with you. Um, I have a pet parakeet, and uh, he's been with me for about five years now. And uh, he started to get sick, and I really didn't know exactly what was wrong with him. Uh, I went to a vet, brought the parakeet in the cage. I came to the vet, I said, could you please help me? Uh, this bird is part of my family now, and we really want to take good care of it. So uh, I explained the symptoms to the vet. The vet scratches his head. He can't quite understand what's going on. He said, you know, I want to get a consultation from one of my associates. <laughs> and so I said, well, all right, this is a little bit unusual, but okay. So he goes in the back room, he brings out uh, Fuzzy the uh, Siamese cat, 
<laughs> goes over to Fuzzy, they have a little powwow. And then he lets Fuzzy out of his cage. Fuzzy goes over, sniffs the parakeet, makes some mental notes, goes back to the vet, they have a little powwow. And the vet says to me, you know, Fuzzy says, uh, we really can't do much for your pet bird. Just gonna have to put him down. <coughs> Uh, I said, well, well, what kind of nonsense is this? Uh, the vet says, oh, wait a minute, I'll get another opinion. Yeah. Goes into the back room again, brings out this huge Labrador retriever on a leash. <laughs> and he comes over to the lab retriever. They have another powwow. The dog comes over, sniffs the bird. <coughs> they have a powwow. And the bottom line is they all agree that there's really nothing that we can do for the, my poor bird. So I said to the vet, you know, I've never seen any kind of nonsense practice like this before. Um, just give me my bill, I'm getting out of here. I'll go somewhere else. And I said, the vet says, well, all right. He starts tabulating the bill, gives it to me, and it's for $850. And I said, what? $850 for this 10 minute little piece of nonsense? He goes, oh, wait a minute, you, you don't really understand. He says, there were only $50 was for the consultation fee. The other $800 is for the CAT scan and the lab tests. <laughs> so, that's a little comic relief. Let, let's get into uh, the topic of the morning. Um, we're going to talk first of all about the US healthcare system. Um, back in the 1940s, there were really about 100 million people who were uninsured in this country. When you think about what the population was in 1940, that's you know, pretty much more than half of the US population. Uh, Harry Truman wanted to develop a national health insurance. He was unsuccessful. And uh, it didn't uh, get until the 1960s, uh, during the Johnson administration, when after a huge fight, and by the way, many doctors were against it, uh, we, we managed to establish Medicare in this country to take care of people over the age of 65 and a certain segment of the population that was disabled. Later on, uh, end-stage renal disease, uh, people on dialysis uh, recovered. But as you can see, once that occurred, the number of uninsured dropped drastically. Um, and then it started to pick up again throughout the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Then with the Affordable Care Act, it got a little bit better. But still, uh, to this day, 28 million people are uninsured. And a fair number more are even underinsured. Okay? So who actually pays for health care in this country right now? Um, about 59% of it is private health insurance, which those of you who are lucky enough to have know that you pay premiums into that. And uh, hopefully if you become ill, your private health insurance company will take care of you. Um, about 4% are really truly socialized medicine, the veterans health care system, the Indian Health Service. Um, about 20% is now what we call single payer or Medicare. Um, and about 14% or so are people just paying out of pocket if they can afford it. Um, so, we have this unknown percentage of people who have health insurance. They're covered by their <coughs> private insurance, or they're covered by Medicaid, but they really don't have adequate health insurance to cover what their health care needs really are. So what do we do? We, we've got a mess here. You know, with the Affordable Care Act worked somewhat. It's not perfect. It's certainly better than what we had before. But we need something far better. This is just sort of a cartoon. But we've tried every way we can to fix the insurance companies, but things still don't work right. And that's really kind of where we are right now. So we're paying a lot of money in this country for health care. You can see that we pay probably one and a half to two times what almost every other country pays. Um, it's, it's reaching $10,000 a year now in 2019 per person. Far more than what every other country, every other developed country would pay for health care. Is that what drove the 
uh, increase in uninsured through the 70s, 80s, and 90s that you showed on the prior slide? Is it the cost, or was there another change that drove that? No, this is just the cost. This is this is what's hap this is what's driving the cost of health care, um, irrespective of who's paying the bills. This is how much it costs to take care of you, me, or everyone else <coughs> per this, year per person. If this charts the per capita cost for every person in the United States, yeah. not what people pay. Right. So it includes the uninsured. Yeah. If you yeah. take our total population divided by what we spend, you get that figure <coughs> over ten thousand dollars per person. But isn't, but isn't it also the profit making though? Well, yeah. I mean, we're, we're not saying where the money's going right now. We're, we're just saying th this is how much it's costing to take care of people in the United States. Now, I'm trying to understand is that causation or correlation to the prior one you showed where you said the amount of uninsured through the 70s, 80s, and 90s increased? Yeah. And is that right. because the cost increased, or was there another reason that the uninsured? Um, I, I guess it's sort of true, true and unrelated. It, it, this chart doesn't relate to that. Yeah, yeah. This is the total cost of health care in the country, without regard to who's getting it, divided by the number of people. Yeah. What's driving uninsured? The uninsured are all in this figure. They're part of the per capita. So yeah. a lot of people were paying that <coughs> per person, but a lot of people aren't getting any coverage at all. Now. This is what the effect of this cost has on the average person. Look at the number of people who are putting off vacation, who are cutting back on other needs, um, increasing credit card debt. And, and this is the only country in the world where one can actually become financially bankrupt just because of incurring an illness or a serious injury. So this is now another uh, way of looking at the same data you know, this is what the United States is spending for health care compared with the UK, Japan, France, Canada. We're talking twice as much. So we've got a problem here. We've got a problem of cost, and we also have a problem that we have these 28 million people who are uninsured, and another 14 million or so who are underinsured. Okay, we're spending an awful lot of money, and what are we really getting for our, for our dollars? So why? Is our healthcare system so expensive? We don't have the elements of an efficient and effective system that all of the developed countries in the world have managed to develop. We don't have universal coverage. We can't negotiate with our pharmaceutical companies as to the cost of what drugs cost. You know, why is it that drugs cost less in Canada or in Europe than they do in the United States? We have no teeth in our negotiation with Big Pharma. And we don't have a fair and equitable system to finance healthcare in our country. So we have a whole bunch of overhead costs built into our system. 10% is insurance, 9% hospital overhead. Only 6% is really the uh, physician overhead. Only about two thirds of the money we spend per capita is spent on truly taking care of people. The rest of it, overhead. Now, we spend an awful lot of money, but what are we getting for our health care dollar? In terms of access, administrative efficiency, and equity, we're not even in the top 10. In terms of life expectancy, we're not even in the top 10. In terms of infant mortality, we're not in the top 10. This is a slide of mortality due to conditions that are amenable to health care. For example, you know, if somebody incurs pancreatic cancer, we can throw as much money as we want on them. Unfortunately, that person is not going to survive. But what about people who get pneumonia or people who have heart disease? In other words, what about the mortality that's amenable to health care? Well, again, the U.S. has the highest mortality in any country in the world. We're talking developed countries here. We're not talking about Botswana, but um, you know, if you compare us with Europe, you compare us with developed countries in Latin America, we just don't cut it. So disparities in healthcare access and outcomes can be based on income, race, education, gender, and where you live. African Americans are twice as likely as white people to not have health care coverage. It affects mortality. We have this inequality that's sort of built into our healthcare system. 
So what's the solution? In my opinion, and in the opinion of many people, the solution is Medicare. It's one of the world's largest single-payer healthcare systems. It's up and running. It works. I don't know any seniors, of which I am now one, who has Medicare, who is so dissatisfied with it that they want to go back to their private health insurance instead. Now, you may say, well, what about doctors? Medicare doesn't pay as well as private insurance. Um, historically, that was the case. In 2019, the difference between what Medicare pays a physician and what private insurance companies pay a physician is narrowing. And for other reasons I won't go into this minute, there are many advantages for the physician of Medicare insurance as opposed to private health care insurance. But Medicare is fair for everyone. It's supported by a combination of payroll taxes, general revenue. You know, Medicare isn't free, and I want to dispel the concept that Medicare for all is going to give everybody free health care. It's not. But it's got much less overhead than private health insurance. It's one of the highest rated plans by both doctors and patients. And it has a very wide network, the entire country pretty much. Probably about 95% of physicians accept Medicare. And trying to find a doctor who's in network with your private health care plan can be a challenge, as I'm sure many of you know. So, Medicare. It's been working now for over 50 years. It's built on our American ideals and values. It's up and running. It's ready to go. It's not like we have to start from scratch. All right, so what's all this going to cost? Okay. Well, we've already talked about 15% overhead in our health care system. Medicare, remember we, we talking about 67% with private health insurance and 33% overhead. With Medicare, we're talking about 15% overhead, half the overhead that we had with private health care. So how are we going to make this work? How are we going to afford Medicare for all? We have $500 billion that we can save in overhead costs, $100 billion in drug costs. That's $600 billion. With that savings, we have enough to cover all 28 million uninsured. I'm not going to say we're going to eliminate co-pays and deductibles. I think that has to be part of the solution. Okay? But we should be able to cover dental care, vision care, and we still would have money left over. So, as I said, back in you know, maybe 10 years ago, more than half of the physicians in this country were against Medicare for all. We do surveys now, more than half are in favor of Medicare for all. And if you poll most Americans, they would agree that the federal government is responsible for ensuring health care coverage. It's the highest level in a decade. The tide is turning. 60% of Americans do favor expanding Medicare to provide health insurance to everyone. So can we afford it? Yes. It's better for our health. It's better for providers. I'll speak to that personally in a second. It's better for the overall economy. When General Motors builds a car, it has to take into account the cost of health insurance for their workforce and the pricing the car. If they did not have to do that, the cars would be cheaper and maybe would compare more favorably with those foreign imports that we have. Now, obviously, it's a complicated story. Um, the General Motors does get to deduct the cost of providing health care to their employees. So, you know, there's an, there are equations that have to be balanced here. But overall, if they did not have to think about providing health care for their employees or other large corporations or even the mom and pop organizations, they certainly would be able to lower prices. And a lot was done from that. The system we can't afford is to continue doing things the way we're doing them now. 
So I'm not going to speak to the legislation. I think Bennett is going to talk to that, and things have changed since this slide was created. But let me just tell you from my own personal vantage point, um, when I see a patient and I have to get an MRI on that patient, the first thing I look at is what their health coverage is. And when I see that they're Medicare, I do a little mental whoop de doo because I know that I can order that MRI, not have to call up a clerk, deal with a, a phone number 1-800-MOTHER-MAY-I, say I've got a patient in my office who needs an MRI, well, you'll have to talk to our medical uh, director and you know, create all these uh, uh, hoops to jump through. Um, I'm sure many of you probably have stories about your interaction with the healthcare system. I don't know if any of you want to share them. Uh, but the point is that I have had many patients who have been counting the days until they turn 65 until they can get their Medicare card. And um, why do we have to wait until age 65? Now, Medicare is not going to be for free. I, you know, there are many, first of all, Medicare for all is this grab bag term that encompasses many ways of skinning the same cat, excuse the expression. Um, some people want to do away with private health insurance altogether. I don't really think that's feasible right now. And, and I think that if we were to begin tomorrow covering everyone under Medicare, we should probably do it in a way similar to the way it's done now. Medicare pays for a, a framework of health care services. It doesn't pay everything. It pays 80%. Those who can afford it, get secondary coverage to cover that 20%, so-called Medigap policies. I think private healthcare companies should be able to continue to sell Medigap policies. I think there probably should be a copay based on income, based on whether one can afford to see the doctor or not. Uh, obviously, a homeless person would pay nothing. but. If Bill Gates comes to see the doctor, I think Bill Gates <coughs> should pay a little bit of money up front uh, in order to get this to, to work financially. So I, I think that right now in this country, we pay for education for everyone. You know, our real estate taxes go largely toward funding the public school system. I think that we have to understand that healthcare is a human right and a moral imperative, and that our country would do better as a society if everyone had health care coverage, which clearly is not the case right now. And a form of Medicare for all, and we can talk about the specifics and debate policy you know, for the next three months, but a form of Medicare for all would certainly go a long way to getting us there. Thanks, so I'm going to turn it over to Bennett now. Tell us about legislation that's currently uh, being talked about. Thank you for a very good explanation, <laughs> which uh, saves me a lot of what I was, what I usually have to talk about to provide a basis for this. I'm actually a little bit more radical than Lloyd in terms of what I think the solution should be. My view is that it's immoral for there to be profit making in the healthcare system. And that the role of insurance companies and privately owned medical facilities like hospitals should basically be driven out. That they are nothing but a drain on the system. And that all the things that have historically been used to criticize a universal health care government provided are exactly what the private sector is giving to us. Rationing, for example. What is our health care system with the dependence on insurance other than rationing, where if you're well-to-do, you can have the absolutely best health care in the world. No question about it. But if you're not among the most affluent people in this country, You've got to fight with networks. You can't necessarily go to the doctor you want. 
you get your claims rejected because their business model is, let's reject all the big claims. We know we gotta pay them. How many of you have had big claims rejected? You take the first appeal, maybe they pay part of it. You take a second appeal, the whole thing's paid. It should have been paid the first time. But they know that by not paying it, they turn it around and it increases their profit. All, the only function of insurance in our system is to organize the wealth of the nation so that we can pay the providers. They're nothing but a middleman. They're nothing but a middleman. They don't provide any beneficial service. They just organize our collective capital, taking a profit, and then pay the provider. This is a natural system for taxation, just the way that we build our roads, right? You don't have to pay a special premium to go on the roads. Taxes collect our collective capital, and they decide we're going to buy the roads. We build the roads. Healthcare is absolutely natural. The insurance companies add absolutely no value. I have not seen a single argument for value added by the insurance company. What they add is profit, and what they add is tremendous amounts of overhead to the system. They got all their overhead to analyze every claim, to reject the claim, to handle your appeal. All that, that's overhead. Print the policies, to sell things. That, that's all their overhead. And look at the overhead for the doctor's office. There's a myriad, and the hospitals. There, there's a myriad of different policies. You gotta figure out how to code it, and depending upon the patient, you might wanna claim code very, very similar things differently because one insurance company is gonna treat it better than another insurance company. Some of you may be working for hospitals where, where that's what you do all day, is you try and figure out What's the best code to get, or my doctor, to get the best compensation so it works? That's a tremendous overhead at the doctor's office. You know, I'm old enough, when I went, I remember when I was a boy and I went to my pediatrician, the doctor had one assistant who pretty much helped with everything. Now you go into a doctor's office, there seem to be more people providing administrative support than are providing support to the physician and providing the service to us. Well, that's ridiculous. What is the value added to our healthcare system by all that? And you can see that over and over again. The pharmaceutical companies, it is, well, we've had hearings in Congress just this past week, but the main thing you got to look at is compare what they spend on research and development with what they spend on marketing. Most of these companies are spending more on marketing than they're spending on research and development. How is that value to our healthcare system? And of course that marketing is just exactly what drives up their price. Because they make a slight tweak on something that should be going into the public domain because the patent goes out. It helps a few patients. The bulk of the people who use that medicine don't benefit from the tweak as study after study has shown. It makes it more effective for some patients. I'm not saying there's no improvement. But they market it and market it, so you don't buy the generic value. Everybody feels, hey, I gotta get the latest version. I mean, what's going on with insulin is just disgraceful. That's a medication that was discovered, what, 70, 80 years ago? And it's been a lifesaver. Should be very inexpensive. People know how to do it, but the price goes up and up and up and up and up because the second Bush administration decided that the government can't bargain. You compare Medicare costs for pharmacy with VA costs for pharmacy, the VA is about to bargain. The Veterans Administration pays 40% less for medication than Medicare pays. What is this all about? It's all about the preservation of profit. The idea that there should be profit. And it's the same with the big hospital corporations. Study after study has shown that the outcomes for patients in the profit-making hospitals are worse than the outcomes for patients in public hospitals. Why is that? The answer is obvious. All of these laws are designed to preserve the benefit of capital, to preserve the return to shareholders. 
My opinion is that that's immoral. And that by, by pushing for universal Medicare for all, we are fighting a, va a battle to preserve our health and the health of our families and the people that we care about. And we're fighting a moral value to take this country off a plane that puts property ahead of people, that puts profit ahead of people, and puts people ahead of profits. That's what this is about. It's a change of value. It is disruption. But, you know, in this country, 18% of the gross national product is tied up with health care. To me, that seems absurd. You add to that the other 22% that goes to the financial sector, you've got nearly half our economy on things that, that should just be transaction costs, right? Transaction costs. We are, but why? Because we want all this property. So where are we today on a legal perspective? We just had introduced on February 27th by Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, a bill called H.R. 1384, the 2019 Medicare for All bill. This bill is a combination of the old bill that Representative Conyers had introduced for many, many years in the House of Representatives, which much of the literature still talks about, H.R. 676. We don't have a lot of new literature yet, which has H.R. Uh, 1384 and Bernie Sanders' bill in the House, in the Senate. And it's a better version of either. After the 2018 election, it was determined by activists in this area and the progressive Democrats who were doing it, that it was time to come up with one bill in both, house, in both houses of Congress and to come up with an improved version and try and get the community that has been act agitating for this type of change all united. So probably Jayapal took the lead and prepared a bill and we and the decision was made not to introduce it until there were at least one hundred co sponsors in the House of Representatives to show that it was a substantial piece of legislation. Uh, Prior to that, we never had more than about 50 or 60 signing on to uh, Representative Conyers' proposed legislation. We got 107 to sign on, including our Congressman, Donald Payne, is one of them. Uh, and it was introduced at the end of February. So that's H.R. 1384. And one of the handouts, in fact, is this one here was prepared by Representative Jayapal's office, which is a very brief summary of the bill. It's a very, very long bill to read. One of the ways that it improves on both the earlier bills is it is less aspirational in the sense that it gives more details as to how things are going to work in terms of implementation and in terms of taxation to some extent and a whole lot of areas. It's more on cost. Another way that it's, that it's an improvement is that its coverage is broader. It covers every, everything that either of the two bills cover, which makes it a broader set. So you now have coverage for all primary care, all hospital services, all outpatient services, all prescription drugs. Dental, dental usually hasn't been included. Dental, it's very difficult to really have meaningful dental insurance, as most of you know, because unlike medical care, where, thank God, a lot of us don't need it every year in any serious amount. Dental care, everybody needs all the time. <coughs> this includes dental. It includes vision care. That's another thing that is usually 
not included in current private insurance. Audiology, often not included. Women's reproductive health services, including abortion and birth control. It gets rid of the Hyde Amendment in all these federal programs. Maternity and newborn care, long-term services and support. You don't have to go on to Medicaid if you got to be in a nursing home. We have a system which is designed to impoverish early ordinary people before they can get medical care that we need. Something like 60% of personal bankruptcy filings in this country have as a, one of the main reasons for filing health care needs. And we all know people who have tried to figure out, well, I guess you're a bit of an expert of that how to get rid of their assets so they can qualify for Medicaid. I mean, I, if you want to know about that, Edgar knows much more about this than I do. But you essentially have to impoverish yourself in order, you've got to spend what you can save, what you might want to give to your children to go get long-term care. The bill includes long-term care. Prescription drugs, mental health. Now that's an area Dr. Walterman talked about how 95% of uh, doctors take Medicare. A big portion of the other 5% are psychiatrists. And psychologists. And psychologists, right. A big part of that is mental health. The, the hope is that more and more mental health care will get to be covered by this. It's designed to improve it and with good things. Substance abuse treatment laboratory and diagnostic services, ambulatory services, and more. What I'm reading for is the sheet prepared by uh, Representative Giant Paul's office. The, the bill also tries to do certain things. One thing that it eliminated, Bernie Sanders' bill in the Senate had provisions prohibiting profit-making hospitals and healthcare institutions. They, <coughs> Representative Diapol, took that out uh, because I think the feeling was we were taking on enough things by going after the insurance companies and the pharmaceutical companies that the private hospitals should be left alone. What it does do instead, though, is it calls for global funding of healthcare institutions rather than a fee-for-service model. They would contract with the government as to what they need as basic support funding to keep that institution running to provide the services that the, ser that the hospital provides. So if they're providing MRIs and CAT scans if they're providing uh, psychiatric services, if they're providing maternity services, what does it cost to run this type of hospital to keep all the basic overhead that you need functioning? There would still be fee-for-service compensation of various sorts for you know physicians, not every physician and every patient, et cetera. It doesn't change the physician reimbursement so much as the way the institutions are compensated. And that those repayments are intended to be the same whether it's a public hospital or a profit-making hospital. So that the incentive to run things in a way that maximizes their profit as opposed to maximizing the service that they provide to the patients is decreased. That, for those of you who might have been familiar with the earlier bills, that's the one basic thing that's come out. For the most part, things have been improved. The ultimate hope, you know, who, who's going to be hurt by this? Well, obviously the biggest losses in places where people's employment and livelihoods will be disrupted is all people work for health insurance companies and all the people who work in medical offices dealing with health insurance companies. That's the sector that will see 
the greatest dislocation. Uh, another sector, another area that will probably be hurt are the more specialized physicians. The hope is that eventually there's going to be greater compensation for the primary care physicians in ways to make it more beneficial for doctors to go locate themselves in area, like in rural areas and other areas where there aren't a lot of insured patients, poor neighborhoods, so that they will be able to provide better medical care and hopefully reduce some of the disparities that we see. I mean, there are tremendous, dis you know, we we're fortunate in that we live in an area of the country and really of the world that has some of the absolutely best healthcare services available to anyone who can afford them or is well enough insured to take advantage of them. I mean, the, the number of doctors, the number of specialists, uh, I, I mean, in my own healthcare, I've been amazed at how specialized some of the doctors I've ended up seeing are. Uh, I see an ophthalmologist who just specializes in the problems with the orbit of the eye. He, do, he doesn't take care of anything else with the eye, just problems related to the orbit. I, I, there's a special name, but I don't even remember what it is. But you, you go out to the middle of North Dakota, you have the same problem that I have, unless you fly somewhere, you can't get that treatment. You know, you're, you're dealing with, well, you're lucky if you have a good ophthalmologist to bring. Frankly, in many parts of this country, you're lucky if there's a decent general practitioner that you don't have to drive a couple of hours to see. So there are aspects of the reimbursement that are that the bill hopes will change to improve that. The idea is to make a more equitable system that gets rid of profit and that well that gets rid of profit and tries to distribute health care more equitably to everybody. It is an everybody in, nobody out. It doesn't matter if you're a citizen or not. If you need health care and you're in the country and you present to a provider, the provider will take care of you and the government will pay for that health care. This idea that citizen that, that something like as basic as health care should depend on whether you're a citizen or not, it's absolutely immoral. What is citizenship but an accident of birth? Because I've been born here rather than a couple hundred miles away means that I can't get health care if I happen to be in this, in this country when I need it, no matter how I got there. What does that have to do with our basic societal obligation? to care for each other, to try and make sure that people who are sick are treated. <coughs> I, I won't get to the whole citizenship. <laughs> but, but, the bill, <laughs> but the bill does address it. Now, can we get it passed? We're working to get it passed. Uh, and there's a, if you take this flyer, there's a telephone number on there, this little one. It's English on the front and Spanish on the back. There's a telephone number that we've set up to call Congress uh, to get Congress people to sign on. Now, we, most of us live in Donald Payne's district, so he's already signed on. It would be nice to call him and thank him for his support. In New Jersey, the only other congressperson who signed on is uh, Bonnie Watson Coleman. We're especially trying to focus on Bill Pascrell, who used to be the representative of many of us in Maplewood until a few years ago, and uh, Congressman Frank Pallone. Uh, so if you know people who live there, or really anywhere, <laughs> who have Congress people who haven't signed on to the bill, it would be very good if you could encourage them to call. The only way we're going to get this passed is with the major campaign to try and get people to pass it. It's going to be an issue in the 2020 election, we believe, which version, and the, the announced presidential candidates, with the exception of Bernie Sanders, are all promoting 
different variants of this, a lot of which I don't feel are as good, but are certainly an improvement. The biggest problem with the Affordable Care Act was that the Obama administration made a, made a devil's bargain with the insurance companies and with the pharmaceutical companies. And, and that, that's the biggest problem that the bill has in terms of not being able to work. That plus the fact that both the insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies put all their money to oppose the implementation of it after it came in. But uh, we're trying to build a campaign to pass it, and we're hoping in the Democratic primaries we'll be able to get a candidate in the end who's coming as close as possible. But actually, we'd like someone who supports HR 1384. Get the number right. So I had to read it. So, so it's a very active medical issue. If you, there were a couple of sign-up sheets that I that we put in the back, and we'd appreciate if you'd sign both of them. I'm just going to tell you about the one that relates to this act. Can, yeah. Can I can I side rail you for a moment? Yeah. Um, for me, part of the question today was how people could sign on and have some impact on this direction. Right. But part of my concern is making sure that people understand what it is they're signing up for to support short of the moral imperative. Right. But I, I, I get to, as a Libra, I get to kind of do this a lot, and so you'll bear with me. I am fully on board with this as a moral imperative. As someone who understands a little bit about insurance and healthcare, um, there are a whole host of questions that come up for me. So part of what I'd like to see happen is that we have the opportunity to talk about what issues or questions you may have audience-wise about the details of this. I'm, I'm going to venture a guess that none of you have a moral objection to the direction of universal health care, but the devil's always in the details. And it seems to me that this move for Medicare for all, for lack of a better term, has a major image and paradigm problem. Okay? Obviously, we can talk about the corporations and the healthcare industry and the profit that's going to be lost. People, uh, certain legislators have talked about the impact on the economy by the lost jobs, the hundreds of thousands of jobs that go to support the healthcare industry. That's going to have a major <coughs> impact on the economy as a whole. But I think also individuals have some issues in terms of understanding what it means for them. I mean, something like, and you know the figures better than not, 60% of people employed in this country either get it through an employer-based system or through Medicare. You know, we can quibble about two or three percent. I think that's a general number that's accurate. I read about a week ago a survey where about 71 percent of the people who were questioned supported the concept of universal health care. But that number fell off the edge when it was presented to them, what if there was universal health care and you no longer had the choice through your employer-covered services? So we've got a kind of image problem with the general population about what this is going to mean for them. And I think digging into the details about how this is funded is important. For instance, most people, do they understand that, that their, their Medicare premiums, particularly for Part A, comes through payroll taxes, half of which is paid for their employer. So a natural question someone asked me is that, okay, if we're going to a different kind of system, does that, incre does that increase my taxes in order to pay for that? And I know that, and I'm sorry, but it, there is a question in here somewhere, but I want in general for you to respond to, to these kinds of issues. Um, and, and Americans tend to want, as I've seen it, cost control, access, quality care, and choice. One of the biggest pushbacks on the ACA was people feeling they were losing that sense of choice. So, so the question becomes, if we're going to become warriors, okay, how do we address for ourselves, but also the people that we're talking to, those kinds of legitimate concerns that somehow someone is going to take over my choice, my access to health care, without a clear understanding of how that's going to improve my health care, and I'm going to be selfish in this regard because I've already said that mm -hmm. over 60% of people 
have coverage in some way or another. They may not fully understand how it's paid for, but they have it. And so a lot of this for me, and I'm there, but I'm just trying to, you know, a lot of this for me addresses a smaller part of the population that while people say they're in support of, really doesn't impact them. I mean, when we talk about the ACA, and everyone talks about the ACA enrollment, what is that, 9% of the coverage? <coughs> 6% is somewhere in that. We've spent a lot of time talking about a relatively small percentage of, no, no, stay with me. No, no, relative, no, 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 what the employer pays comes out of the pocket of the employee. And you can see that in the statistics very easily. For the last, ever since the Reagan administration, income and wages have been absolutely stagnant. They've grown at a rate below inflation since Ronald Reagan has been in office. But the cost per hour to the employer for their employees has grown. How is it that people are getting less in their pocket, but the employer is paying more? It's all the health care dollars. It's all the health care dollars. When an employer pays the payroll tax, that's coming out of my paycheck. Because if they weren't paying that payroll tax, when they when they figure out what they pay me, they gotta include that payroll tax. So when they say, what does it cost to employ Bennett Zorowski, they gotta include the payroll tax. That's gonna that's been coming out of my pocket all along. It requires education because people may see that they're paying a greater tax that they can identify, but it's going to be a low and stable tax. I make my living principally representing labor unions. And since I became a labor lawyer in 1982, which was in the part of the Reagan administration, <laughs> every, every major difficult negotiation that I've been involved in, and every one that I've seen nationally, where there are strikes, the issue time after time <coughs> after time has been health care benefits. Overwhelmingly the number one issue. They have hidden it from us. And we don't realize the cost that we're taking. It does require education. In terms of choice, the way the host the way insurance has evolved in the last couple of decades, it's the insurance companies that are controlling the price. Under this program, there's no network. Every doctor is going to participate. It's not, well, no, you have Aetna, and I only take Horizon, or vice versa, or I don't take Cigna. It, it's Everybody's in. Everybody takes Medicare. There's no other choice. So it increases your choice of, of physician. It increases your choice of physician. I mean, just the other day, I went to a doctor. He was referring me to, he felt he needed to refer me to somebody. And he was asking me, well, who's your insurance company? <laughs> yeah. So he would decide. I don't want him to, to refer me to somebody based upon who my insurance company is. I want him to refer me to somebody based on who he thinks will provide the best care for whatever problem I have that is causing him to make a referral. And I want to then be able to call up that doctor and do my best to get an appointment if there's room on the schedule, on his or her schedule. That, that's what we want. So, so it should increase choice. It, it increases your choice as to what type of insurance coverage you have. But that's a maze that nobody understands anyway and you can't do anything about it. The classic example is, okay, I know who my regular physicians are. I'm going to choose a policy that covers my regular physicians. But then, you know, God forbid you have to go to the hospital and they've got to put you under anesthesia. And another one of the big groups who don't accept insurance are the anesthesiologists. Because nobody gets to choose. And, and all of a sudden, some anesthesiologist who just happened to be the one on duty that day in the hospital, or, or maybe it's the one that, that your doctor really prefers to use. However, that anesthesiologist got there, you got a big, totally uninsured bill. Yeah. 
That, that, that's just not going to happen. And, and there's nothing you could do in your selection of insurance companies to protect yourself against that. It's impossible to protect yourself against that because you don't know what out-of-network services you're going to need. You only know what services you're getting now. But nobody knows what's going to happen to them. You know, we, we can't only... Right. It would be a lot easier to start a new healthcare system from scratch than to try to get from here to there. Um, one problem Americans have is we, we tend to have inertia. Right. You know, we like what we have, and it don't bother me. I'd rather talk about something else. Um, you know, the problem is nobody realizes that they're going to need health care until they actually need it. And by the time they need it, they don't have time to think about the ramifications of their insurance coverage. All they're worried about is getting better. Um, so I, I think the, we need to be more proactive about not only understanding that this is a moral imperative, but you know, climate change is a good analogy. I mean, you know, nobody wants to talk about climate change because it doesn't affect them right this minute, but it's going to affect everybody sooner or later. And, and we, we just need, as a society, to address issues that, frankly, people put on the back burner all the time. Mm -hmm. What I just want to say before you go to the basement, I'll be quick about it, is this sign-up sheet is to say that you'd like to work in support of the federal bill that I've been talking about most of today. It's for the uh, fight to win Medicare for all campaign. Uh, if you sign up this, I'm going to be sending it to a group that will be contacting you with uh, propaganda and hopefully encourage you to come up, come out and help us campaign for it. There's another sign up sheet back there and I just want to briefly talk about Lloyd and I met because we're both active in the New Jersey Universal Healthcare Coalition, and I put uh, this flyer out there in the back. You can read more about us, and it's a sign-up sheet. We have a New Jersey bill which proposes a, a statewide Medicare for all. Uh, we, we just got it introduced in the summer of 2018. And in all honesty, since the giant poll, since the election, we're focusing more on the federal law. But we had this, when we originally formed, our focus was entirely on the federal law and the Congress bill as what we were pushing. But we decided that it didn't look like it was going anywhere with all these Republicans in office and with the roadblocks in the House. So we were working on a, on a New Jersey only statewide universal health care coverage bill. And we tried a number of things that some other states, like Vermont, New York, California, have had very active campaigns, and some other states have as well. And we finally decided that to make a single state system for universal coverage had all sorts of problems and would require a lot of overhead because we'd have to create our own agency with all sorts of our own rules. And we eventually decided that what we should propose is to ask New Jersey to become a model jurisdiction of Medicare for all, that we would pass a bill in the legislature that says we want every New Jersey resident to be covered by Medicare. And we'll figure out how to pay the premiums as part of that bill. Federal, let us be a demonstration model. And there, and there is an example of this in a small town of Montana that is such horrible air conditions from asbestos or whatever. <coughs> that they couldn't be covered, uh, that was carved out in order to get the ACA through. They gave them Medicare for all of that now. That, that we want that. So that, that's the bill that we are campaigning for, but we are also actively now campaigning for the federal. So if you sign up on the sheet that looks like this, I'm going to send that to the New Jersey Universal Healthcare Coalition, and uh, we'll get your propaganda from that. Do you have a number for that, though? Uh, yeah. Yeah, we do. I read the other question. I have a quick question. I just want to make a, a few statements. How many of you know the Free Cycle ad that comes across your Facebook page? It's a free cycle in which people can say, I want these things, or then people can say, I have these things to give away. Okay. Yesterday morning, what I saw on that Free Cycle was people who need to have insulin because they're out of theirs. 
if that doesn't scare anybody into wanting to promote Medicare for all, I don't know what will. Uh, the, then uh, during um, earlier in the week, the Trump administration cut the size of fines for health violations in nursing homes. What? Oh, yeah. Yes. Why would they do that? Because they want to save money. For how many of you know how much CEOs at insurance companies or pharmaceuticals got as their bonuses? Well, Annual bonuses. And you, we ask, how would we pay for this? <laughs> If I could just add one other thing. Let me just answer a question with, the, with yes. the bill numbers for New Jersey. The assembly version is A2269. That was introduced by uh, Assemblywoman Jimenez. And then the uh, Senate version is S2598. That was introduced. Did you say that again? Yeah. The Senate version is 2598. That was introduced by Loretta Weinberg. Uh, it's the same bill. It's A2269 and S2598. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And actually, that's maybe something we can work on our local people because they haven't signed on yet. Can I quickly say, um, in case people don't know, that there is a uh, town hall today with our assembly um, senators. Uh, and senators and the assembly representatives at Moral Church at, five, at three. three to five. Just yeah, all three of them will be there, right? Yes. Yeah. So I just wanted to make a comment about pharmaceutical marketing Bennett was talking about. Um, to me, one of the biggest sins in this country has been the development of direct-to-consumer advertising of, of uh, prescription drugs. For the life of me, I don't understand it. Um, these commercials are little mini dramas. I'm sure you're exposed to five to ten of them a day. Uh, they purport to make you a better person. You're going to live a happy life forever if only you take this drug that they're marketing to you. And then they spend the last ten seconds of the ad telling you that you could die from it. <laughs> Very quickly. Where, 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 where is the rationale for this? And I don't know how it ever got approved. We in New Zealand are the only two countries in the world that allow this. And, and to me, very low-hanging fruit would be simply to abolish the whole concept of direct-to-consumer pharmaceutical. Well, then you have the First Amendment wrong. Mm -hmm. It's how they implicit the First Amendment so it helps capital and keeps down working people. Right, it allows and corporations to have free speech. The unions violate the First Amendment. Yeah. But pharmaceutical ads right. and, and, and Citizens United are required by the First Amendment. So are there questions? Jackie? Um, I, I'm Jackie Herships and I have unfortunately had to use the services of Medicare uh, a lot. And I have to say, it's been unbelievably wonderful. I'd be dead if it weren't for that. And Edgar helped me a great deal navigating the system, which is impervious. I could never have understood it. So anyway, I have just uh, I have a million questions, but top of mind is a perception one. Related to what you're saying, my perception is that doctors are leaving Medicare. I keep hearing that. Oh, they don't take Medicare anymore. Uh, I would, uh, hospitals are, I just want to finish my question. This is a perception. I hear what you're saying, and I'm, I'm happy to hear what you're saying. But what I've been hearing in the world is doctors are not taking it more and more. Then hospitals, I see hospitals closing in cities, and that frightens me a lot. And I notice that doctors, in some cases, are becoming uh, establishing concierge practices uh, for the wealthy because the system isn't good enough. So I'd like it to know if you could address that. And also, is it possible for these wonderful programs, or are they trying to implement them in incrementally as well as other ones? Well, you know, you, basically what you're saying is that, that people are always going to develop anti-missile missiles, right? If, if uh, doctors can't make money 
one way, they're going to try to figure out a way to do it another way. Um, I, I don't know the statistics, I can't quote them to you. I can only speak from my personal experience. I, most of my colleagues have become more in favor of Medicare for all than less. They, they have not been leaving Medicare in droves. Um, I do have a few friends who have gotten into the concierge business, if you will. I, I think that's immoral, personally. Um, I think if Medicare for all does become uh, the law, I, I think that would be one of the things I would like to see abolished, along with uh, Medicare Part C, which is Medicare Advantage. I, mean, I don't know if you're familiar with the term, but Medicare Advantage is a very popular form of Medicare now, where instead of people signing up directly with the Medicare system, they sign up with a private health insurer that basically contracts with Medicare and they get all their care through a private health insurer anyway, even though they're Medicare age. And uh, you know, basically that's a ripoff of Medicare by the private health carrier. Um, but uh, you know, I, I agree with you, there, you know, there's, there's always gonna be an outlier, there's always gonna be somebody who's trying to figure out how to make a buck by taking the existing laws and turning them around and making them work for them. Um, but unfortunately, uh, that's human nature. Uh, but I, I don't find most doctors leaving Medicare. Um, I'm so glad you If I can also respond to that. Those concierge practices can only exist in a part of the world like ours, where you have very affluent people who, who can afford to pay. It's a form of providing, you know, the best medical care in the world only to those who can afford it. Absolutely. And you know, I think that's why Lloyd feels that it's an immoral thing to do, because that's what it comes down to. In terms of the closing of the public hospitals, in, in the hospitals and cities, that's why Edgar wondered why I mentioned the Muhlenberg fight. Uh, Muhlenberg is a, was the first hospital in Plainfield. And it was established by the community at large after there was a train wreck there that killed a number of people and caused a tremendous amount of injury that people weren't killed. And uh, the, the community said, we really need a proper hospital here because they didn't have the ability to take care of it and the consequences would have been less bad if, if they had. And because of the amount of poor people that they were serving, the amount of Medicaid patients, and especially the amount of uncompensated care patients, uninsured, it was no longer economically viable. One of the big corporations took it over, the JFK uh, Hospital Corporation, it's down in Middlesex County, took it over, and they just said, it's not economical for us to run. All these places, and you know, we have a fight now with University Hospital in Newark, the last public hospital in Newark, because there's been so much privatization that all the public hospitals are expected to run in the pack. You know, it's like it's like low-cost housing. Certain things can't be provided in our current society without very significant government support. And that's why they're closing. They need very significant government support if they're going to provide for people who don't have means. So the concierge practices and the closing of hospitals in urban areas, and of course we've seen it here, Urban Ten Hospital, you know, closed just very nearby to here. Um, we, we, there are two sides of the same coin. The, 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 the bill, that the, the Jayapal Sanders bill, tries to deal with that with this local funding for hospitals rather than on a pure fee-for-service basis so that the hospitals will be set up so that they can provide the services that they're expected to provide and their basic funding will come from that. So there's an effort to address that. Uh, the bill does provide for a transition, but at a certain point, it, it is going to be disruptive. But we seem to think it's, dis we think disrupt our, our Congress and our president seem to think disruption is wonderful when it throws thousands of people out of work 
so the capitalists can make more money, right? They love that disruption, right? Uber killed all sorts of taxi cab drivers, more ordinary blue collar type working people. But you know, people who own Uber, they're not worth billions of dollars just for, just for being the middle to provide the person on the street with a somewhat quicker way of hailing a taxi cab. Uh, and now they're talking about driverless cars and driverless trucks. Talk about, talk about what that's going to do. How many millions of people in this country make their living driving? But you know, our government policy says, oh, that's terrific. This is the world of the future. This disruption is only used as an argument against things when they help people in the lower 50% of our society. They're never used for anything that helps people in the upper one-tenth of one percent. As a matter of fact, anything that helps the greatest one-tenth of one percent in our country, that seems to be what our politicians love. I'm sorry. Um, uh, two comments and a question. Uh, first comment about choice. I heard the good doctor say that he thought that 95% of doctors were in Medicare. I don't see Medicare, I don't see that as a choice threat. I don't get that. I think we should debunk that at every possible turn. Um, the next question was about, um, I uh, just retired uh, as a Morris County government uh, employee. Um, you have heard Christy say over and over again that we have to get rid of the Cadillac <laughs> Medicaid, you know, health programs that the state has. Um, county government is, is separately insured, thank God, and so it wasn't part of that uh, for, medic for medical. Um, but I paid in my last year um, $4,500 out of my paycheck uh, for my coverage. I paid that um, and it was well worth it and I believe what what was the, the health care act of the act of 2011 that would be what one-third of the total so my employer my Medicare my cost went up and up so I believe that it was ultimately one-third of the total premium uh, for, and the state and the county paid the other two um, so there are all kinds of ways that, you know, plus just in public relations, <laughs> that there was a huge cost to all of us for employers paying. Uh, uh, but, but the last thing was, uh, the actual question was about, and um, I was gonna ask you this the other night when you were talking to Pop about this very topic. Um, we haven't, in terms of hospital compensation, institutional compensation, I haven't heard thus far in the new bills introduced the same wonderful discussion that we had with the Affordable Care Act about the uh, wonderful uh, hospitals, the Salk Institute, the Cleveland Clinic, um, that are where there's compensation, and maybe it's just for doctors, but it's based on outcome. It's not even based on services. It's based on outcomes, and I think um, unrelated to legislation, that it would be great to have that model introduced to more hospitals, and it can't happen if the hospitals all become privatized. It can't. Well, that was actually one of institutions like that, some of which are private, uh, are one of the reasons also why you know, Representative Jayapal uh, wanted to preserve it, because the hope is that that sort of model will increase in prosper. She's from Minnesota, right? No, I think she's from Washington State. Washington, oh, okay. Washington. Yeah. So I think she's from Washington State. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, but it, the feeling was to let the different types of healthcare institutions uh, go their own way and to try and affect, uh, you know, with this funding that all of them would get this. And to the extent that we're able to lower it, that would drive more to these more efficient models. Uh, one of the reasons the profit-making places have worse outcomes is on this fee-for-service basis, they have an incentive to have people come back because they make more, because they're delivering more services. Uh, the feeling is if it's on the global funding, that incentive is gone, 
So we'll focus more on just getting the patients well and not necessarily chasing them out if they're not ready to be chased out. Part of the question that comes up for me was you talk. Please? <laughs> are you seeing an audiologist? <laughs> <laughs> I am, yes. Is, yes. It, is, it, it, is it covered? Maybe you know? of our, Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. So, for, for engaging that. Um, part of the question that comes up for me again is funding. You talk about paying $4,500 a year as a single coverage? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Part of which is paid by your employer, right? No, 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 that's my, my, no, 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 no. That's in my Part budget. of the overall premium is paid okay. for by. Right, but Two it's thirds. a decreasing amount each year. You realize that? I do realize okay. that. <laughs> Bear with me. So the question still becomes when we go to something like a universal coverage plan. How is that then funded? How does that change your premium, if at all? Well, and since I ask the, long questions, I'll stop there. Well, the, the, the answer to that is, how we change your individual premiums, I don't know right now. But what we do know is the overall cost of society and what our entire United States, out of private pockets, out of public pockets, is paying. And of that, over 20 percent, 20 to 30 percent, is just going to overhead and profits that could largely be eliminated. So that's number one. The overall cost of society is going to come down significantly. The overall cost to everybody in every now how that gets distributed to people, that's going to be different. I contend that what the employer share is, it's really all an employee share. Because when an, employee, when an employer budgets, they have to figure out the overall cost of that employee. Whether it shows up in my paycheck or not, you know, it seems more painless to me because I don't see it as a deduction on my pay stuff. But it's really coming out of my pocket the same. If employers are paying less, one of two things are going to happen to that money. And I think it's going to be a combination of both. I think the employee pay, take home pay is going to go up, <coughs> and the company's profit is going to go up. Now, depending upon how it actually gets implemented, it, the way things tend to be implemented in this country, it tends to go more to the employer profit than the employee paycheck. Mm -hmm. hopefully, hopefully, we're going to see changes in that, and I think there are some things in this bill that are designed to do it. But there's going to be some form of taxation. And there may be some form of premium payment like there is now in in Medicare. I mean, if you if you earn more money, you pay more for your Medicare Part B premiums in particular, I think it is. Yes. Mm -hmm. that, that's on a that's on a sliding scale. I mean there are the idea is that this will be a progressive taxation that's in the bill, so that if you don't have much, there's not gonna be anything at the point of service. <coughs> and it's not going to affect you. I think one of the things that's being talked about is a payroll tax with a matching employer payroll tax. But it's going to be on a sliding scale, so the greater the pay, the greater the percentage goes into that tax, and the lower the pay until at certain levels there's no payroll tax on those jobs at all. And I think that's the model that's in the Jaya Powell bill. Have we done some of the numbers myself, and then I'll move away from this. I think that the ability to respond to people in terms of the impact it's going to have on them is the one thing that's truly missing from this bill. As I understand it, the Vermont bill, the Vermont proposal kind of stumbled. It foundered. It, it foundered when they looked at the fact that there would have to be an increase to payroll taxes and income taxes for individuals in order to pay for the plan. And so that kind of set off an alarm for me that the numbers really weren't something that were presentable to the general population and the understanding of how the savings was going to occur relative to, say, premium costs. And I think until we can kind of present to the general population what that means, that it becomes a difficult sell. I well, mean, I think that's true. But I also think that we have to keep circling back to the moral issue. Our military 
cost so much more than this is going to cost. And when you look at the charts of what we spend on our military, which exceeds, if you combine everything, that the top seven or eight nations pay for their military, that includes China, that includes Russia, that includes Israel, that includes all the big militaries in the world, we are like 30% higher than the top eight military spenders combined, and Trump has the goal to, to, to submit a proposed <laughs> budget that has a gigantic increase in military spending and cuts Medicare and Medicaid in the budget that he introduced last time. So we have to have a moral discussion. We say, why don't we say our military costs too damn much? And that we need to spend the money. I'm sorry. Why don't we say more that our military budget is too damn high? You don't know how to pay for health care. You don't know how to pay for schools. Take it out of the military. We don't need a bigger military than than thirty percent more than all the other than the rest of the world. You're preaching to the choir. We have but another question. But, that, but those are how we have to answer. We don't yes. just answer it. Yes, we have to admit there's going to be a tax. Yes. When it comes from the military, I would rather pay a tax than pay an insurance company. And I think that's another part of it. Would you rather pay a tax or would you rather pay the profit and the two hundred million dollar salary of all the health care executives and the and the insurance executives? Those are the answers. Nothing is free. What, what's, what's that phrase by Robert Heinlein? There ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Absolutely. Tom Stoffel. It's going to have to be paid for. <laughs> we have a couple more questions. Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. You're right. I did jump over. Go ahead. Um, okay, I have uh, two comments and a question, although I don't know if, if it can be answered. One is I think that the issue of many of the issues that you raise uh, need to be, I mean, if, if, what I'm hearing is that we need to do some kind of marketing and education, as you say, to in, in, in advance <laughs> of um, actually having people vote for it because of these issues. Something that's broad so that people will know, you know, okay, you're not going to lose this, you're not going to lose that, and the various issues around choice. My other um, comment is about um, even though as, as, a, as an activist, I'm still concerned and, and believe me, I am, as I'll get to my question, absolutely for Medicare for all. But I am concerned about the average worker in the healthcare industry that's going to lose their jobs. Because what's, you know, that's, this is not people at the top 1%, they're average everyday people. Now I know there may not be an answer for that, but that is a concern for me. Well, what, well, there, what there is in the bill, in the Jayapal bill, is there specific Money's much more generous than past programs for for job retraining and extended and extended unemployment okay. benefits and, and, and things like that. Uh, there is no doubt that there will be disruption in those industries, and we can't pretend that there won't be. The bill does try to address that with with uh, with much more money for job retraining that has been in similar types of job retraining. And, and, I would and also an increase in yeah. There should, yeah, there should be an increase in the Medicare right. processing employment right. rate. Well, right? the nurse right. right. yes. yes. out of Not clinical enough. nursing to work for insurance companies to do this paper pushing. And, you know, one of the reasons is because it's a lot easier to push paper than it is to change bedpans. So I, I would argue that nurses are not getting paid what they deserve to take care of patients they're going to industry. This is where a lot of these workers are going to come from. And those nurses can be retrained to go back into the clinical environment, take care of people, get paid what they deserve to get paid. Um, so I, I don't see that many people losing their jobs, frankly. I mean, I, I know where you're coming from. Hospital coders are going to lose their jobs. Um, you know, people who answer the telephone for uh, the head of uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield is going to lose his job. Uh, but All the people work in the doctor's offices too, but yeah, no. I'm not at my question, <coughs> yet, right. which is, okay, I came here because I am self-employed, so I don't have this option of, uh, of the insurance that you get from your business. And the, the um, 
which I'm one of the uh, underinsured because the prices are so high right. for a person who is self-employed. Now the reason I'm self now I didn't know how this worked. So I come here and I realize not only would I benefit from, from um, Medicare for All, but I may not benefit on the provider side because I'm like private practice, I'm a, I'm a psychologist. Now what concerns me, yes, I felt a little bit better when you said mental health. I felt a little not so good when you said psychiatrist, only because psychologists tend to be the ugly stepchild of the Medicare profession. And it wasn't even included in that. And I'm wondering, is it just that you forgot to include it, or is it not included in this bill? And in addition, while, again, I am still absolutely pro-Medicare, but not only Medicare for all, not only for myself, but because it's a conviction, conviction at the same time, Medicare pays a lot less, not a lot less, but they pay less than the current insurance companies do, sometimes significantly less. So am I going to gain on one hand and have a reduced income on the other? I, I, if I said psychiatry care, the term that, that is usually used in the summary is mental health care, which yes. I understand to include psychologists. It does, but then you mentioned, so I don't think it was well, right here, psychiatrists. I, 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 I probably did. <laughs> I, I, I mentioned them as being, especially in my experience, among the groups that don't want to accept yeah, insurance. They, paid, they, they don't want to accept insurance. For 10 minutes of time. Yeah, <laughs> they, 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 many of them don't are, are out of the networks and they don't accept Medicare. Mm -hmm. that, that's the only point I was making. I don't know enough. In my experience, psychologists have more likely accepted those programs, but, but not always. No, no, that's not Medicare. Yeah. And, but that, like I said, Medicare pays less. You know, okay, yeah. are we going to be still the ugly stepchild here? Or, you know, like the doctors get paid a significant amount, respected in this, in, 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 in this society. The, so is psychiatrists. Right. But the, the bill as proposed doesn't. I don't believe gets into the weeds of what the reimbursement rates are for all the different services and specialties as proposed. I think that it's the hope of the advocates that a lot of the unfairnesses and problems with coverage that exist now because of these unfair reimbursement rates would eventually be addressed. But I don't understand that to be part of the bill. I think, it, I think for now it pretty much, except for where it's expanding services, I think it proceeds on the model that the current reimbursement rates would survive with the current methods of changing those reimbursement rates. So I don't think I can give you, you know, direct encouragement on that. Yes. So there, was a, there was a woman here. Yeah. Um, I love the idea of Medicare for all. I love my my Medicare. Although I should tell you, it doesn't cover hearing aids, which are thousands of dollars. Anyway. But the new bill is intended to cover yes, those types yes, of yes. But yes. my concern right now, because this is going to take a while to come to fruition, is as you mentioned, Bennett, the current administration wants to cut Medicare. Yes. So I'm wondering if the organizations that are looking to bring about Medicare for All are working um, to oppose the cuts to current Medicare. The, the answer is that, that most of them are. I mean, it's a broad coalition. If you look at this flyer with the list of groups in the New Jersey, you know, there are a variety of groups and, you know, not everybody is working on every issue. It's certainly the, the, the program of health care <coughs> of so many umbrella groups like Healthcare Now. Uh, by the way, the two best flyers that are out there, I think, are these two. Uh, they certainly oppose, you know, all these cuts. And frankly, I think with the Democratic majority in House of Representatives, we don't have to worry about any cuts going through in the next two years, unless he does it by emergency order. <laughs> <laughs> because the medical emergency in this country is that patients get too much. Because seniors are a terrific voting block, yeah. and those those proposals have never succeeded. Right. I read. What I wanted to say in regards to the question about the training in the Jaipal bill, uh, as was stated I, in the conference I went to in uh, Montclair, because there was a union representative there, and he said that, that there is a massive training program that's in place. 
where they will take people who are in the private insurance places and retrain them to become part of the Medicare system. So I felt a lot better about that aspect of it. Are there other questions? I don't have a question, but I have a comment. Right now, I'm on uh, Medicare, and I'm not getting anybody paying for it. I'm paying for my own Medicare. But in addition to that, I'm spending $7,500 on other insurance to get long-term care, to get supplemental insurance, to get dental insurance, and to get prescription insurance. Mm -hmm. That is a lot of money. I definitely will welcome universal Medicare, universal Medicare. Thank you. One of the arguments is to allow Medicare to negotiate prices for drugs with, with, yeah. with Big Pharma. <laughs> and the giant coal bill does include long-term care. That's one of the major improvements of the Jayapal bill. It includes long-term care. Say that louder. Uh, there was a question over here. Was well, just a comment. Um, full disclosure, uh, I've lived in this town for the better part of 75 years. Uh, I've met Senator Sanders twice, once in Middlebury, Vermont, another time in his offices in Washington. Uh, also, from medical perspectives, being an Air Force veteran, uh, and I am on Medicare, uh, whatever Medicare doesn't pay generally is picked up by TFL. That's not Transport for London, it's TRICARE for Life, which I got as a benefit for serving 22 years in the military. The, and I've also served as the Vice Chair of Legislative Policy and Strategy for the National Association of Railroad Passengers. An overall comment, there is only so much money that a particular society and economy generates. I'll be in Washington this year again, our annual meeting, April 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. We lobby the Hill, we go around to the Senate office, we go around to the House offices. We meet with representatives. I've met twice already with Gottheimer. I've met with Joe Biden. It goes on and on and on. But the thing that everyone has to keep firmly implanted in their mind is that this is going to be an entitlement program, along with Medicare, along with Medicaid, along with defense, along with folks like I who advocate for better passenger rail service throughout the country in general and New Jersey in particular. There is only so much money to go around. Every group, every organization is, especially in the spring, is in Washington making senatorial and, and, uh, and house visits. They all want more money for their particular cause. There is only so much to go around. So I guess my comment is, and, and yes, because I, will, I, I should also mention I sent money to Senator Sanders quite a lot back in 2016. You have to understand that this program needs to be self-sufficient. Eventually, there will be a cost cap. There has to be a mechanism to keep costs level, not that the physicians decide, as you mentioned and you suggested, that they're going to find another way to enrich in their pockets, okay? Not that the people who do MRIs and CAT scans and all the rest of these very, very um, uh, high cost electronic and technological tests, they've got to have a cost cap. If this plan, if, 13, if House 1384 can say that it is gonna be at worst, or maybe at best, cost neutral, there is a chance of it, of it weaving its way through the House where legislation begins and getting it passed and then passing it over to the Senate. But there has to be some, some very strict and firm financial controls. That's, that's the quid pro quo. The benefits are on this side of the ledger. The liabilities are on the other side of the ledger. And as we all know from Cost Accounting 101, assets have to equal liabilities. So thank you. But you you're 100% you're, you're correct on that. It, it can't, 
the, the main ledger that you have to look at, though, is not just the government spending, but society's overall spending. And that's going to be decreased. But in terms of government, there are going to have to be additional taxes to fund this. There's just no other way to do it, and you can't pretend that, that there is another way to do it, or else there's no way to get there. In terms of controlling the cost, it's going to use the Medicare model where the government is going to set the reimbursement rates for, you know, the health care services. Now, you know, certain specialties and certain types of providers have to some extent been able to gain that system, but uh, not so much. I mean, Medicare is overall one of the better reimbursement systems out there in comparison in to the extent you're able to control the costs. I mean, a lot of doctors have complained that the reimbursement rates don't go up. Uh, and it becomes especially clear because Congress in its budget pretends they only do them as, as if it's not really part of the budget, that it's just a temporary bill to raise these reimbursement rates. It comes back every couple of years and it's gotta be reauthorized as a way of pretending that they're not really increasing the budget. I mean, those things are going to have to be addressed. I think you're very correct about the cost cap. Uh, you know, an MRI in the United States costs quite a bit more than an MRI in Japan, even though you're getting the exact same service. Um, why is that? You know, we, we're going to have to figure out a way to cap the cost of, of certain. Well, part of it is too much providers. I mean, yeah. there used to be a certificate of need program before you were allowed to set up something like MRIs, but due to a lot of agitation in politics, that stuff left. So if there are more MRI units that can be constantly kept working, that means that all the ones that are left have to charge more in order to keep functioning. I would add, I would add Hopefully that. by this global funding of the major institutions that they get funded what they need to provide the services they're providing, but that will tend to lower the prices of some of these things. I was going but to add that Medicare has done a far better job of controlling costs than any other system. system. So that we're talking about being able to put caps if this kind of structure is put in place. I think you have much better control. The other piece, and, and I saw your hand raised, <laughs> the other piece that I wanted to add to that is that when we look at systems in other countries, what I've noted is that they don't include health, um, dental insurance, vision insurance, or long-term care. Other countries have have that as a tack one where you still purchase that separately, that is through a private insurance. And one of the reasons, particularly when we talk about long-term care, which I know far too much about, is the cost that's related to that. So it, it is something that in this proposal will have to be reviewed because it's a major driver of cost and may not be realistically included in the larger piece. Well, this is a very ambitious. It's a proposal, it's very. This is a very, very ambitious bill, but again, Long-term care, you know, to say it's very expensive is absolutely true. But the fact is that poorer people tend to need it more than richer people because they get less care all along. So, so all the, you know, in terms of societal justice, it's very important that long-term care be funded. But yes, this is a very ambitious proposal that expands things. But, you know, uh, the Rockefeller family never has to worry about long-term care. But all the people who, who've led, you know, who've been among the working poor have had hard, difficult jobs. They're likely to need some long-term care more than the people who've had good medical care and good coverage and a, and a fairly comfortable life. So to a lot of us, it's important to try and keep it in. Well, long-term care is a longer discussion. Yeah. We'll save that. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here and hear everybody's input. I'm learning a lot. I'm looking forward to be covered by Medicare someday. Uh, question, how is Massachusetts universal care working for labor people? Well, the, the Massachusetts that? was the model for, for what came to be known as Obamacare. The Massachusetts program was the model that became known as Obamacare. You know, it's working better than the Affordable Care Act from everything that I read. It's working better than the Affordable Care Act because it was encouraged by the government rather than sabotaged by, by the government as much as possible. Uh, it, it has problems. There, there are a lot of people in Massachusetts who support, uh, who support this. I mean, among the 
among the Democratic candidates, there are a lot, including Representative Cologne, <laughs> uh, who's, not a, who's not a presidential candidate, but he chairs the committee that has principal control over this, who are focused on improving the Affordable Care Act and getting rid of a lot of the problems that are in the Affordable Care Act. That, that's definitely, a lot of the presidential candidates, when they talk about universal care or other things, that's what they're talking about. Some of them are talking about making Medicare, lowering the age for Medicare eligibility to 50. That's another thing that's out there. So what some of the presidential candidates are talking about, what people like Frank Pallone are talking about, is bringing the Affordable Care Act more to like what's been functioning in, in Massachusetts. And also other improvements beyond what's functioning right now in Massachusetts. And they're also talking about some of the universal plans are to make Medicaid available to all, or to make a public option, which is often Medicaid instead of Medicare. That's what some of them are proposing. See, see there's a public option, which I think one of the biggest mistakes that, that President Obama made when putting forth the Affordable Care Act was not allowing there to be a public option on the marketplace so that people could buy into Medicare, pay a premium. And the reason was the insurance companies wouldn't live for it because they all knew that the premium for Medicare coverage and the coverage would be superior to what they were able to offer because they wouldn't have to worry about the profit. So that was kept out. And even now, when they're talking about public option, a lot of them Again, I think because of the power of money in lobbyists, and it's a terrible demerit to those candidates, their public option is buy into Medicaid. And as most people know, with the exception of long-term care, Medicaid is inferior to Medicare in many, many ways. Um, so, you know, you have to look at the specifics of the program. And uh, at one time when I thought about this, I, I got a sheet of paper which compared all these various proposals. I, I didn't break it, <laughs> and I don't know. But those are some of the main ones that are out there. Elaine, did you have your? Barbara more or less kind of mentioned it. I was, was curious about um, self-employed people and how you know, there are more and more people who are self-employed and how this would affect those of us. Well, it depends how the taxes. They'd be covered the same as everyone else. Your employment has absolutely nothing to do with whether you're covered under the giant bill. But depending upon what tax goes in and where that is, if they go to the payroll tax model, it means that self-employment tax is going to go up. Yeah, it means self-employment tax is going to go up, just like you have to cover your Social Security and things now. So why should you already pay for your tax tax? Well, no, you, you, your Social Security doesn't pay for this. No, I mean... You're, you're paying a Medicare premium. I mean... You know, there's no employer who's going to pay a share of the tax. That so, so it may be that certain taxes are going to go up. So the self-employed people, as a lot but of but it's likely it's likely that the amount that your taxes are going to go up is less than you're paying for your health care coverage now. Right. See, that that's that's what I believe will happen. Right. That, that you're going to be paying less for health care. But it's more in the tax bill. You know, it's this propaganda that got an overdrive from Reagan. Yeah, you know, right. I'm from the government. I'm here to help you, right? He said those mysterious words. Ever. <laughs> he was full of shit. You'll forget the expression. <laughs> Certain things can only be done by the government. So taxes will go up. But I believe, and every study after study has shown, that health care premiums are going to go down. I mean, part of the problem with public hospitals is that uninsured people or employers you know, I always hated when they said, what, you're going to force employers to provide coverage for their employees? They're free riders. They get a competitive disadvantage over all the employers who are doing the right thing by not paying the coverage. Why any politician would have the goal to stand up there and say we should protect that selfish interest was always beyond me. It was always beyond me. They're getting a competitive advantage over the people who are doing the right thing. But because all legislation seems to be, how do we get the most profit to the people who are taking the profit? Uh, you know, that became an argument against mandatory employer coverage. I don't know. <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, oh, 
first of all, full disclosure, I worked for a health insurance company for 17 years. I also worked for a physician office for 13 years in pediatric office, and I've worked in hospital systems. So I kind of have a varied background. I am for Medicare for All, for all or universal health care. I have been for years. Um, I'm probably not quite where you are, <laughs> but more where you are, with especially now, just to try to get the public buy-in. I do have some worries, I do have some concerns, one of which is the health uh, healthcare fraud. Um, and I worry that, you know, when you speak about coding and they're worrying about, well, what code to use? Well, you know what, use the code of the procedure or the diagnosis that you do. Don't upcode because it's against the law. If you look at the opioids, that's how they found them is through the billing right. and the coding. So, uh, you know, when I worked in credentialing, which was for the practitioners. Uh, you want to make sure that whoever that practitioner is you're seeing is licensed in, in the state that he's in or her, has an appropriate malpractice, uh, is a specialty they say they are. So, I, you know, I worry that that's going to get lost. Now, one of the big, if there is one universal coverage, then you instead of having independent Blue Cross where I worked, have a credentialing department, and Horizon have a credentialing department, right. and United Healthcare right. has you have one, but you don't. I just want to make sure that control that 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 there's somebody minding the. I the, agree with the somebody's got to be minding the store. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, um, as long as you know, I, I, somebody once said, uh, "Behind every great fortune is a great crime." You know? <laughs> People are always going to try to find a way to game the system for their own benefit. Game. Uh, look what's happening with college admissions now. Yeah. I, I, I don't know how to solve that societal problem. I, I wish I could give everybody a pill to give everybody integrity, honesty, and a conscience. <laughs> if I had that power, believe me, that would be the first thing I would do. But um, unfortunately, people are people. Um, and I, I think you're right. Uh, if we are going to have a universal health care system in this country, we need to have some sort of an overseer committee to make sure that everybody's playing by the rules. Yeah, although I, I will say that the credentialing aspect, I don't believe is in this bill. You know, it, as I understand the medical license, you correct me if I'm wrong, it allows you to practice medicine. It doesn't limit you to a particular specialty. It does not. And you don't lose your license if you're practicing you outside the bounds of your core competence. True. Right. And, and, and this and this does not and, 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 and yes states are different uh, to the extent that credentialing it ensures that somebody who says they're an endocrinologist is in fact a, a competent endocrinologist that, that is a good service maybe I was a little too strong in saying that and it sure don't so provide just, any value added because they, they provide protection against that this bill does not provide protection against that I think that would be a very difficult thing to get through Congress to make that a part of Medicaid. You know, what, the main reason Edgar said that this began, I don't know, with, with Sanders or something, but, but FDR wanted to establish universal medical care as part of the Social Security Act. And, and then, of course, Truman really made a much more effort. And the principal opposition to that was the American Medical Association. In recent years, the major journals and the AMA, well, a lot of the major medical journals now support this, and the AMA has greatly softened this opposition to the extent that I think it's almost could be characterized as neutral. And you have groups like the one that, that Dr. Alderman belongs to, Physicians for a National Health Plan, which I think has the best single website on this stuff, uh, who are very actively campaigning to support it. But I, I think that if we try to put that into the bill, the credentialing piece, that would probably make the much more of the medical profession opponents. Oh yeah, they, they but, against but but the opponent, but the fraud. You know, we have a Congress that cuts back on auditors in the IRS and cuts back on investigators for Medicaid fraud and Medicare fraud. They'd rather say it's a system plagued with fraud than actually police it because they oppose it and they want people to dislike the system. Well, CMS does a pretty good job with some of the, the fraud with, with uh, DNA yeah. or what ambulance It's picked up in recent years right. in whistleblower laws of health because they, they passed the whistleblower law about 20 years ago. So now if you turn in the fraud, 
and the government prosecutes it and gets uh, several millions of dollars, you get a bounty under the federal whistleblower statute. And that has done wonders for like, the <laughs> fight that we're making. And what do the Canadians do? I don't know. Confidentially. I don't know. <laughs> Is it combat fraud to me? No, credentialing. Credentialing. credentialing is different from fraud. Yeah, yeah, right. No, I understand. I'm I don't know. Sure. I want to just take a couple more questions. I mean, we'll certainly stay here for as long as folks like. But I just want it's getting on in time. Irene had her hand up, and then you. Okay. Did you have a question? Or were you just waving at me? I just was wondering if we're done. No, we're not done. 12.30. Um, in New Jersey, uh, I just heard Phil Murphy say within the last week, and I wasn't aware of this at all, um, and it may have to do, well anyway, I'll say what I heard, um, was that he introduced legislation that would assess employers of a, who are currently exempt from covering their employees because they have 11 or fewer employees, whatever the number is. He, he, he wants to assess employers per capita for those employees. I'm not sure if that, where that money was designated, if it was going into Medicaid or what. Do you know? I think he has proposed something like that. I don't know where the money goes. Yeah. I've heard him say that. I don't, I don't know how far that's going to get, but uh, yeah. I, I, I can't speak to that. Yeah, I don't know if there's an actual bill, yeah. but, but that, that I have heard discussion about that. I mean, there's a whole thing with this issue of small employers. And, you know, should you, if a person can't afford to pay his employees a minimum wage, I mean, a, work, a living wage, if we decide there should be a living wage, should that person stay in business? And it's all this politics all the time that we don't want to hurt these people who can't afford it. But my own view is, well, if you can't afford to pay your employees what people need to live, well, then maybe you shouldn't be in business. Your business is not strong enough to be a business. We only want businesses that can provide a decent lifestyle. You know, it's just, again, it's our society is always asking, it's always concerned about who's making the profit from the enterprise rather than what it does for labor, what it does for the people who actually have to work, what it does for people. The focus is always much more on the money than on the people. And, you know, I'm a great advocate of switching that around. Society should be trying to improve the life of its people, not necessarily improve the profits of its richest people. But that's the whole inequitable distribution of wealth, which which next to climate change is the biggest problem facing the world, and of which this is a subset. This is an effort to re, to make a more equitable distribution of wealth in the sense that it transfers into the health care. We're going to do one more and then try to close out. Okay, then um, you mentioned that um, one of the main problems with the cost of <coughs> medical care, of, of pharmaceuticals and things like that, um, we could not uh, negotiate, the government could not negotiate with them. And then later on you said that um, it was Bush who made that one. So is there a way to re re resend or re allow them? Because particularly if the government is going to be the one that... When they, brought, when they brought Medicare, when they brought prescription drug coverage into Medicare, which was an improvement during the second George W. Bush administration, as part of that law, it said the government can't negotiate the pharmaceutical prices with the pharmaceutical companies. When, and that opened up the door for them to raise their prices basically without limit because they knew that Medicare was going to pay for them no matter what they charged. <coughs> well, everybody else is going to pay. They're not going to charge. They're not going to charge for cash unless they charge Medicare. So, so that was one of the major drivers of increased pharmaceutical because <coughs> he said Medicare is now going to cover it and Medicare is the biggest buyer in the country. I mean the thing is Medicare covers the most, the hardest to cover people. All the people on disability, 
and all the older people, who has the most medical insurance in those two groups? So, so, so they'll pay for the pharmacy, but they can't negotiate the price. It was terrible. It was an absolute giveaway. Okay, so is that when you, can, you, can they re, you know, well, this bill gets rid of it. That bill gets rid of it. Yeah. This bill gets rid of it, absolutely. Yeah. This bill, a major focus of this bill is the pharmaceutical. Yeah. Right. And the main thing is to get rid of that. And, and it's worse than that because it says all bills have to be bought by this because nobody's going to have private coverage of any sort. So all the bills come through here and we're going to negotiate. That's part of so, every presidential platform, every Democrat. We're going to bring bring this to a close um, because I get named moderator. I get to say some additional things. You'll forgive me on that, and I'll try to talk louder. Thank you. One of the things, as I looked at this audience today, that concerned me is that most of us are right on the door or over the threshold for Medicare. We're having a discussion that impacts the entire population but we're only dealing in this room with an older group and that's in that perspective. I would hope that we could have a follow-up um, because I think there's a lot more to absorb and understand about the direction that's being taken and that we could also encourage some <coughs> younger, older people <laughs> to come and be part of this discussion. Because I, I, it's hard for me to understand how we get the kind of momentum that we need if the people who are most going to be impacted by this are not involved in the discussion. Don't hold it in the senior center. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm serious. So that's a reasonable point. I'm okay, serious. Point. Yeah. So we'll have it in a gymnasium. We'll, we'll take that to heart. <laughs> well, the principal organizer of this was senior share. That's right. And then, and well, then, then so the action yeah. came in late. So, but thank but, you for that comment. Perhaps we can look at the Woodland or some other place yeah. in the library. library. But I would, I would ask you to keep your eyes and ears open because I suspect we're going to have a follow-up. We'll be. I know we'll we'll be happy to do it. I expect Dr. Walterman would be happy to do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Please sign up if you want to do it. Thank you.